on socks, so we're, the world is good today. A um, couple of announcements. We just boxed up our sweaters for uh, the Montree Mr. Rogers sweater program thing on Wednesday at 3.30. Uh, we had 37 sweaters, men, women, children. Yay, us. We did a good job. Um, the other thing is next Sunday, Byron Wade will be our guest pastor, and we will have a light breakfast um, at 10 o'clock next Sunday uh, before church. It'll be just like a, a casserole, an egg casserole, egg sausage casserole, whatever, and cinnamon rolls, coffee. Um, so we will um, have that next Sunday. Other than that, I have nothing. Any, did I miss anything? If anybody wants to go Wednesday with us to this Mr. Rogers service, then let us know. And go call yeah. carpool. Yes. It's at 3.30, so I imagine we probably need to leave at 2.30 with parking and everything. So we would be leaving, let's just say here at the church, if you wish to go at 2.30 on uh, Wednesday. Anything else? If not, let us worship God. I will tell you, Wanda got a call from uh, one of the uh, women in the church, and she said, I've ordered a cookie cutter that when you cut it out, it's uh, a, a sweater and a tie, and I'm going to decorate it a red sweater with a zipper and a tie. So I'm looking forward to seeing what she does with that. Grace Nichols. So uh, they they are they're getting excited about it, and I appreciate y'all participating in it. Our call to worship: Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and, and declare thy mighty acts. Praise to the Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, and Sustainer. Our hymn is number 19 in the red hymnal, God of Great and God of Small.
when we confess our sins, God is always just and merciful to forgive us our sins. So let us use the prayer of confession as printed in the bulletin to confess our sins before God. Eternal God, we are full of sin and weakness. We pray that you will change our grief of our guilt into the joy of forgiveness, that we may be delivered from sin and set free to serve Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Dearest our steps in this ship and protect our souls in faith that we may be steadfast in your service. In his name we pray. Amen. In Christ we have been forgiven and we can declare with confidence we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Jesus answered them, 
The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. And if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And wherever I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd standing heard it and said, It was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. May the Lord add rich blessings to the reading of the word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our hymn is number 247 in the red hymn. This is where you want to sing it, right? Yep. <laughs>
You know, uh, sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we don't understand. Ed Beck, a minister, a Methodist minister, and uh, was down at the beach during spring break one year. And there were college students down there and doing what college students do, drinking more than they ought, a little rowdier than they ought. And there were both uh, genders of college students there gathered around and one young man climbed up on the hood of the car and lay himself out and said, I'm Jesus dying for you. And the other students started screaming, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Ed Beck stood there and thought, what are they doing? This is so sacrilegious. He soon realized that one of his colleagues who was there with him had shared with the students earlier that they were ministers. And he said, I realized they were doing this for our benefit. We were holy Joes and they were proving to us that they weren't so holy. <laughs> he said, and I looked down at my watch and it was four o'clock. About the time that Jesus had said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said, I wondered, Ed, can you forgive them? These students have no idea what the crucifixion means. I have no idea what the crucifixion means, he said. I try to understand it, but I just don't quite get it. I just don't quite understand all there is to it. That's the struggle on the journey to Easter through Lent. It's how do we prepare ourselves for what is to come? When even those first disciples who had direct contact with Jesus didn't quite get what was to come. Didn't, didn't have a full understanding of what the crucifixion meant. What the suffering meant. Philip Reef uh, says that any church that preaches, he's a sociologist, says that any church who preaches on the suffering and death and the cross of Jesus will never grow. One church in California took that to heart and they told the architect who was designing their new building, we don't want any cross here. We don't want any sign of the crucifixion. We don't want any resemblance of suffering and death. That's not what we want in our new church building. We want it to be airy and light and welcoming so that people feel good when they come here. We're not gonna say anything about the crucifixion because we don't want people feeling bad when they leave here. wonder about that, don't you? I mean, we put up crosses. Some of us even wear crosses around our neck. It became very popular a few years ago to have a cross around your neck that was turned sideways. I don't know if you saw those. It was attached at both ends of the, the top and the bottom of the cross, so the cross laid sideways. And I, I saw several people wearing those, and I thought, that's an interesting way to hang a cross. Maybe it's that I don't want a sign of uh, destruction and torture right there in front of me. So I'll fix it a little prettier. Put it on a gold chain, make it out of gold or silver. Somehow sanctify this symbol of death and torture. You know, the, the cross was the most torturous way to die because you didn't die from having nails put in your hands and feet or lashed to a cross. <clears throat> the way you died 
was from exhaustion and suffocation. Because as you hung there and wore out, you dropped. And it was almost like getting your wind cut off. And so they put a, a plate there. If you've ever seen, they have a, a kind of plate where the person being crucified could push up and take a breath and then drop back down. But after a while, after sometimes days of doing that, you finally gave up and died. It's just so hard and, and, and so, you know, uh, so mean. It was a mean way to, cruci to put someone to death. It wasn't like hanging. Hanging's a nice, clean way to kill people, you know? Well, we don't think of it that way, but it's quick. You snap your neck, you're dead. Not, not a cross. The cross is one of the most evil ways of crucifying somebody that you can imagine. Putting someone to death. You know, uh, Will Willimon says that, uh, what is it on Palm Sunday that we're cheering for? You, you know, what is it that we're celebrating? on Palm Sunday. We're coming up on Palm Sunday next Sunday. And it's always a lovely thing. We, we would have the children come in with palm branches and those who weren't hitting each other waved them and looked kind of cute, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as a matter of fact, one year, the, the, whoever was in charge of the palm branches had the children come down and circle back around three times. <laughs> And somebody said, where are all these children coming from? It did look like a lot of children. You know, uh, they were having a parade, celebrating. Even on Palm Sunday, the disciples and those in Jerusalem, we have not understood what's to come. What's next? The woman says, what are we celebrating when we do that? What are we celebrating? Martin Nemelone, who was a German theologian and was put in prison in Dachau, <clears throat> uh, expected to be killed. A lot of his friends, including Dietrich Bonhoeffer, were hung for what they had said against Hitler, the things they had said against what was going on that they knew about, uh, turning the state in for what they were doing. He said, outside my cell, I could see the gallows. He said, I would watch people as they were hung some of them went fighting and screaming and crying. Others went as if they were at peace. And I wondered to myself, how will I go? How will I move towards that day? When they come for me and it's my day to die, how will I go? Will I go at peace knowing that my Lord will care for me? Or will I go kicking and screaming, not quite sure I'm ready? It's a hard journey. This journey from Ash Wednesday to Easter. It's a hard journey for us. Every year it should be a hard journey because we're trying to comprehend what it is Christ has done for us. What has Christ done for us? You know, one of the most amazing things about this, and it's been going on, I guess, for a hundred years now, or, or close to it. I, I don't know how long uh, the NCAA tournament's been going on with 64 teams, but uh, as long as I can remember, maybe as long as you can remember, and 
It parallels Lent. Have you ever noticed that? That this journey parallels Lent? That the, the weeks from Ash Wednesday to Easter oftentimes match up with even the final four happening on Easter weekend sometimes? It doesn't this year. It'll be the week after, I think. But we'll be in the tournament by this time next week. Palm Sunday, we'll be in the tournament. We'll be at the end of the Sweet 16 by Easter. And then the final four. And in 1983, a little college over in Raleigh won seven of their last nine games. Not expected to, but they did. And they even won their last five games to become the NCAA champions. Same ones that won last night. The ACC champions. Little state college over in Raleigh. They had to win five games. They weren't expected to win the first one, much less the second one, or the third one, or the fourth. And surely they wouldn't be able to beat that college in Chapel Hill. No way. In 83, they went on to win the national championship. I don't expect them to do that this year. But... <clears throat> The coach has come up with a slogan, why not us? He asked him, why not us? Why can't we compete? We have all of the, uh, all of the players we need. They even have a, 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 a tackle on the football team playing for them. I don't know if you've seen that guy. He actually has roots in Clover, South Carolina, where I was. I knew his mother. I'm sure she's proud of him. He scored 20 points last night. Hit his first three-point shot ever in any college game. He's in his third college. First three-point shot ever. And uh, it, it's remarkable to watch. And you think, this is so unlikely. Hey. UAB, the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and to, uh, Temple University in Philadelphia were not supposed to be playing for the championship. No way. It was supposed to be South Florida and SMU. Purdue was supposed to win the Big, big 12. They didn't. You know, something's wrong with basketball. The wrong people are winning. But for me, for me, it's good news. Because it says it's never over till it's over. Jim Valvano was the coach in 1983. And when they won the national championship on the last second shot, I don't know if y'all remember that, he was running around the floor looking for somebody to hug, anybody to hug. He was so excited. It wasn't long after that that he was diagnosed with cancer. And Jim started a foundation. And, and the slogan of that foundation was his slogan. Never give up, never quit trying. Never give up, never quit trying. And that, that was his statement for the cure of cancer. Never give up on it. We're going to find a cure and never quit trying. Sometimes we're so quick to give up, to quit. I've told you about Henry Van Sant, the 
he was on the search committee when I went to Greenville. He had been a, 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 a defensive coordinator for ECU, went to Elon and was the head coach for a while, didn't do so well, came back to ECU as assistant AD and um, had retired by the time I got there. <clears throat> but Henry said to us at a game, guys were coming up speaking to him. I said, who are all these guys, Henry? He said, those are former football players. And he said, uh, but you know, he said, I don't remember them so much for what they did on the field. And some of them were really good, but he said, what I've been intrigued with is what they've become. Not what they were on the field, but what they have become in life. And I take a lot of pride in the fact that they have done well. Many of them have done very well. You know, that's our test. It's not where we've been or what we've done so far, but what we do next. That's the message of Easter. What is next? Are we going to give up and quit trying? Are we going to keep struggling to understand and to be the people of God? That's what we're called to. We're called as Christ was called, not to glorify himself or to glorify ourselves, but to glorify God in all that we do. Even if it's playing basketball or football or baseball or whatever, lacrosse, whatever we do, we're to do it to the glory of God so that God in Christ is glorified. That's our call as God's people, as Christians, to glorify God. May it be so. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> Confess what we believe. What is it we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Say the name again. Todd. Todd. Okay. 
and lower back pain. Is that what you said? Uh, no, he had to go back to the emergency room again. Oh, oh okay. See, <laughs> it's awful. Sorry. Um, okay, Todd, Herman, Elsie. Anyone else? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do pray for those who are in hospital, who've had surgery this week, who are recovering, and we ask you to bless them. For those who live with prolonged illness, we pray, O oh God, that you would walk the journey with them. Suffering is not easy, and, and we don't like it. Sometimes that's where we have to go. But we can't go there unless you walk with us. We can't make it through unless you go with us. Father, we pray for all of those who are suffering on this day. We pray for the people of Rafa and Gaza as they face an uncertain future we pray for the people of Israel, for those who support their prime minister and for those who have questions. We pray for the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia. We pray for those who oppose the present leadership in Russia and for their willingness to stand up and be heard even amidst the danger. We ask you to bless them. Father, sometimes we, we think what goes on in other countries don't affect us, don't matter. We have no concern for them. But that's only because we don't really think they're human. We don't believe they're our brothers and sisters who are suffering. And yet they are. And we know that you care about each one of them. Teach us, oh God, to care. For the desire to help, for the sweaters that will be going from this place to the homeless of our community, we pray. For the example that Fred Rogers set for us in sharing and caring and acceptance of others, we thank you. Father, we thank you on this day for saints like Patrick of Ireland, who believed that it was important to serve you even at the cost of his own life or at the risk of it. And Father, we ask you to be with the people of both the South and North of Ireland on this day. Keep them at peace with one another. Bless those who would disturb that peace to change their attitude. So many of us have our roots in that nation. So we ask that you would bless them because they're a part of us too, both in the North and the South. And Father, we pray for our own nation. We're entering a season of trying to call out leaders. And it is a confusing season for us. We want to do it right, at least on our part as individuals. We want to make right decisions. But we need your wisdom to do that. We need you to direct us in how we should vote. The things that should be passionate to us, 
and the things that we could let slide. There's no way we're going to agree with everybody. Yet help us. Help us vote for kindness, for humanity, and not our pocketbook. That's a hard thing to do, God. But help us do it. Help us do it right. To the end of all this, we pray the words that you have taught us as disciples that we should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now continue our worship by the giving of our gifts. And let me remind you that uh, during this Lenten season, we're taking the one great hour sharing offering, right? Yes, we have. Yes. And uh, I, I actually, a little bite, the little fish bite came, so I've been sticking chains in that. So. You'll have fun counting that, or somebody will. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that is an important offering, y'all. It, it, it goes to uh, the hunger program, self-development of people, and Presbyterian disaster assistance. And all of those get almost 90% of their funding every year from that offering. So if we're able to feed people, and care for people and help them economically and be there when disasters happen. It's because we give them that offering. So I would encourage you. Uh, I plan to turn mine in on Easter Sunday, but you can turn yours in any time. Mm -hmm. Just mark it down. All right, Larry. <laughs>
helper. As you go out, get ready for Easter. <laughs> get your minds right. Never give up. Never quit trying. And remember, God loves you. God loves you more than you can imagine. God loves you so much that God did not spare the Son, but gave Him up for us. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with mercy. Amen.